Building on the promise of the fast but fragile 1991 Williams, 1992 became one of the most dominant seasons in F1 by a single driver and car. With blistering raw pace, natural talent and bags of experience, man and machine were now in perfect harmony, with Nigel Mansell becoming almost unbeatable in the gorgeous and game-changing Williams Renault FW14B. This finely tuned championship winning team that was built around Mansell's requirements should have been the start of a multi-year championship winning dynasty for both team and driver. But just a few short weeks after finally winning the title however, it was all over. Williams, in a baffling move that they would repeat constantly during their title winning years and eventually cause the downfall of the once great team, decided to dispense with their championship winning driver. In Mansell's case, they opted to bring in a semi-retired, not raced for 18 months Alan Prost for a brief one-year cameo. While he was off at the concession at the last minute to continue racing for Williams in 93, Mansell felt the Prost's political influence and the bias of a French engine supplier would create an unlevel playing field for him to compete fairly for the 93 championship, and thus ended the Mansell dynasty just as it was starting. But what if this had never happened? What if, instead of constantly shooting themselves in the foot like some drunken idiot with a minigun, Williams had the foresight and common sense to not view their drivers as just light bulbs, and instead build on what was achieved in 92 and continue with Mansell as their number one driver? So no Prost, no Senna driving for free, and no overtures to a young Schumacher. In this video, we will look at how Mansell would have performed for Williams' remaining championship years, from 1993 up until 1997. I won't spend too much time considering the careers of other drivers, such as Prost, Senna and Schumacher, and how Mansell staying at Williams would have affected possible moves to different teams. Instead, I'll mainly focus on the Williams drivers and the real-life rivals for the title during those years. 1993 is the easiest of the years in question to evaluate. With Patrese getting seriously long in the tooth at this point, Mansell would have a new, inexperienced teammate in Damon Hill. Building on his momentum from 1992, Mansell and the 93 Williams would have been even more dominant than they were a year earlier. Senna, Hill and Schumacher would all win a race here and there and provide credible competition in some races. But over the course of a season, Mansell would have been unbeatable. In a dominant 93 car, Prost managed to win the title at the canter without barely breaking a sweat. As a newly minted world champion with a new contract in his pocket, Mansell's confidence would have been at an all-time high. In an Adrian Newey car built around him, Mansell would have absolutely dominated once again, claiming a second world title and winning 10 races to reach 40 F1 career wins. 1994 proves to be a little more tricky. With Electronic Aids banned, Williams had lost that dominant competitive edge they had enjoyed over the last two years. However, they still managed to produce arguably the fastest car on the grid, but with Mansell being able to adapt to a different kind of spec to over 40 years old? Given his guest appearances in 94 resulted in some great drives, including a pole and a win, I'm going to say that he still had the raw pace to compete at the front of the grid and fight for wins. While he may not have been quite a Hill or Schumacher speed in real life, we have to remember that this was after nearly two years out of F1. If he had stayed with Williams, then I think it's fair to say that he would have maintained his extra edge that would have allowed him to fight for the title again. We will of course assume that he wouldn't have suffered the same tragic fate as Senna in Imola that year and had been able to develop and iron out the issues Williams were having in the early season. But with a much more confident and competitive teammate and a superstar in the making with Schumacher and his <clears throat> somewhat legally dubious Benetton, Mansell would have to fight like never before to win the title. It would have been a super close call and you could easily argue for a different result, but I think with the momentum he built up over the last few years and with the majority of the teams backing, Mansell would have just managed to pip Schumacher and Hill to win his third world title, winning 7 races in the process to reach 47 wins. 1995 is where things start to get a lot more contentious. Williams had again produced a very fast car that was capable of fighting for race wins in the championship. But having learned their lessons from 94, Benetton and its star driver were a team on the rise, aiming to win their first title. While in real life, Hill came up well short against Schumacher, no less a figure than Adrian Newey himself stated that he believed Mansell would have won the title in the 95 car. 
had he been given the driver's promise in 94. Mansell would have been pushing 42 at this point and considerably older than his main rival Schumacher. So how would a 42 year old stack up an F1? If we look at modern examples like Fernando Alonso, we can see it's possible to remain competitive and fast well into your 40s, but physically and mentally, I feel the Schumacher would have had a fairly sizable advantage over Mansell in 95, pushing the Englishman to his breaking point. In the real world, Mansell had pretty much given up on F1 by 1995, which can hardly come as a surprise when asked to drive this bread bin on wheels. But with a competitive car, and not facing the stresses of starting over again with a new team, a 95 Williams Mansell would have been a completely different beast. But with Benetton and Renault fully behind Schumacher, and the desire for a new, younger world champion superstar to usher in a new era for F1, I feel that Mansell would have come up short against the German, losing his first world title challenge in three years. In 95, he would win only four races, but still managing to match Prost's record 51 win total. While many would see this as a changing of the guard moment and maybe even consider retirement, I feel that this could have been the event that would re-energize Mansell and give him a second wind. Always a fighter and one to defy the odds, Mansell would have redoubled his efforts and wrung every last innovation and development out of the team for a new title challenge in 96. 1996 would have been a straight shootout between Hill and Mansell, with Williams now dominant again and Schumacher and Senna having little impact in the course of the title fight, it would have been a close run thing, 96 Damon Hill was now in his prime. Experienced, fast and eager to win a championship and emulate his legendary father, it would not be easy to overcome his younger teammate on speed alone, this is where things could get a little murky for Mansell. Having learned the dark arts of F1 politics from his former teammate Prost of Ferrari, Mansell would use all his influence with Renault, the team, the sponsors, and his huge profile and power as a three-time champion and global star of F1 to disadvantage Hill's side of the garage, even going as far to enforce the team to impose team orders on Hill. While going against his nature to compete on a level playing field, having come out of the 95 championship bruised and bloodied, Mansell at this point would have been wise enough to know that he can no longer simply outdrive his younger and faster rivals. While contentious in many quarters and somewhat damaging to his reputation, Mansell would have taken the 96 title from Hill to become Britain's first four-time champion, winning eight races in the process, taking him past Prost to become the most successful F1 driver of all time on 59 wins. Finally, we move into the last year Williams were ever truly a great team. With a car that was once again the class of the field, Mansell and Hill would be fighting for the title. With a vastly improved car, Schumacher and Ferrari would also be aiming to join the challenge and disrupt the status quo of the title fight. But with a far faster second driver in Hill, instead of Fretzen, I feel that Schumacher would not score as many points as he did in the real world 97 title fight, and would not have been in contention come the end of the season. Now pushing 43, and having achieved everything he ever dreamed of, I think this may have been a year too far for Mansell. Eager to repair his somewhat damaged reputation following his contentious battle with Hill in 96, Mansell, realising that he no longer quite had the pace and fight in him for another stressful and demanding title showdown, would have spent the season acting as more of a rear gunner for Hill. This would have allowed Hill to take a lot more wins, while Mansell spends race after race holding Schumacher behind, costing him major points in the title fight. While still capable of the occasional win and blistering turn of speed, Mansell's motivation and the physical demands of top flight F1 would by now be seriously taking their toll. So Damon Hill takes the 97 title, finally emulating his father and securing his place in F1 history. Mansell considers his position and, while still feeling he can race at the highest level, decides to move into retirement. Mansell still manages to rack up three wins in 1997, taking him to 63 career F1 wins and cementing his place as an all-time great, and as the most winning driver in the history of F1. So there we have it, a massive what if regarding Williams and Mansell. Maybe you agree or disagree with my analysis. If so, be sure to comment below and let me know how you think 93-97 would have panned out had Mansell stayed at Williams.